Welcome. Um, this is a great turnout. Um, I haven't seen many of you before, and that's fun. Um, I have seen many mm -hmm. of you before, and that's fun too. Um, for those who are just coming in, um, there still are seats in here, and there are also a couple of seats I didn't realize were available right here, and um, there's some places in the back there if you need them. Um, so uh, this is the colloquium on labor inequality and human rights, and we are finally to Aisha Parla, um, who is our speaker here today. Um, well, from the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, where um, she is a visitor and was a member last year, um, and it, I had the great pleasure of getting to know her and some early stages of this work. Um, she's, her regular position is as Associate Professor of Anthropology at Sabanki University in Istanbul. Um, and uh, Aisha writes and re researches and writes on a number, in a number of areas, uh, migration, citizenship, labor, ethnicity, globalization, and transnational processes. So in short, basically everything we've been working on um, this semester. Um, and uh, she is speaking to us today about labor migration, um, specifically from Bulgaria to Turkey. Um, and in doing so, we'll make a number of interventions um, in law, anthropology, and, 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 in, and I was gonna say anthropological and literary discussions of hope. I could also say, and in legal discussions of hope, but I'm not exactly sure that's, that could be a bit of a stretch. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, we have hope, or not. Um, anyway, she's drawing from a number of different chapters um, from her forthcoming book by Stanford University Press. It's not forthcoming just yet, though. Uh, it is, it is. From a book that will be published <laughs> relatively soon, and likely by Stanford University <laughs> Press. Um, and it will likely be entitled um, <laughs> Precarious Hope, Migrants, Law, and Relative Privilege. Um, and uh, there are, just so you know, Aisha, you've met some of the students in the class, but they're mostly, actually raise your hand if you're a student in the seminar um, so that Aisha has a sense of who and where you are. Um, uh, Aisha will speak for th around uh, 40 minutes and then we will have a response from our own Heather Hinman. Um, and Heather's an anthropologist and associate professor of Asian studies here at UT. Um, she works primarily in Nepal, where she's done work for a long time, um, on issues uh, that include labor, social theory, and gender. Um, and her most recent book, um, I'm sure there's a forthcoming one too, but the but since we're sticking with Stanford University Press, um, it was published by Stanford University Press in 2013, entitled Mediating the Global Expatriates Forms and Consequences in Kathmandu. And one of the, she'll be responding um, to Aisha's paper for about 10 or 15 minutes. And one of the great things about having responders is often we, we try to get somebody either from a different discipline or from the same discipline but a different part of the world. And so, um, it, the, the second would be the case here, um, but we also have an audience from a variety of different disciplines who can chime in from their perspectives. So please join me in welcoming Aisha. Thank you, Karen, for this wonderful introduction. Is this fine? I want to make sure I'm close enough. Good, okay. So the talk today will draw on my not yet forthcoming <laughs> book manuscript uh, entitled Precarious Hope, Migrants, Law, and Relative Privilege. And excerpts from the talk have already been read by um, seminar participants of uh, Karen's seminar, and I have received super helpful comments and feedback on what I sent them. I might not be able to address them in the talk today, perhaps during Q&A, but they will definitely make it into the revisions of the book in rethinking and even nuancing some of my formulations. So thank you again um, for those wonderful response papers. Today, the talk addresses a major theme from the book, not hope, 
but precarity. Um, and, and what I do brings together different strands of the book uh, in a way that has become its own thing altogether. So this is very much uh, a piece in construction, although it draws on material I've thought and written about. Um, but because I'm thinking of it in a different way, all comments would be especially welcome today. The book, to talk about it briefly, addresses the legal production and circulation of hope among post-90s labor migrants from Bulgaria to Turkey. Against the overwhelming focus on migrants and refugees in despair who hope against the odds, Precarious Hope explores the significance of relative privilege in structuring hope in Turkey, a geography marked by the persistence of authoritarian regimes, legal states of exception, and a strongly ethno-religious foundation for citizenship. I thus rethink the limits of belonging, not through the perspective of those who are most marginalized, but for whom legal and cultural privilege is intimated and only occasionally delivered. My examination hope in the full spectrum of entitlement, perseverance, and complicity, so hope not just as this obviously good category of experience, but as something that we're also governed through, um, this examination of hope in its full spectrum carries comparative relevance to groups in other national contexts who, while not entirely secure in late capitalism, still benefit from white privilege, especially in their encounters with the law. I keep hearing a blip blip sound. Is that just me? My voice is carrying over fine. Okay. All right. So an overarching theme of the book that pertains to my talk today is to nuance what has been variously called processes of inclusive exclusion of migrants in receiving nation states. Exclusion by not granting full rights, inclusion through incorporation into the informal labor market. So I nuance exclusive inclusion by demonstrating how the entity often glossed as the undocumented migrant is differentiated through degrees of relative privilege. Today, I will focus on what differentiation in terms of degrees of relative privilege does to the concept of precarity, as well as what it does to the increasingly heavy burden that the concept of precarity is being made to carry in everyday discourse, social policy, and scholarship. Once a rather provincial coinage, precarité, deployed primarily in France, Italy, and Spain in reference to flexible, contingent, and irregular work conditions, and adapted by labor movements of the 1970s, now everything from insecure work to environmental hazards or to our frailty as human beings is increasingly subsumed under the term precarity. The concept has become ubiquitous in anthropology, sociology, geography, and citizenship and migration studies, with migrants around the globe being designated as the new emerging precarious class. Now, sophisticated theorists of the precarious usually take care to distinguish between precarity and the precarious. The former is more specific and historically inflected, while the latter is more general and can be universalized. Put differently, while there is an ontological sense in which all life, for everyone and everywhere, may be said to be precarious, precarity is used to refer to specific conditions of existence that are without predictability, without a safety net, without job security. Judith Butler captures the distinction between the two in the following way. Precarity is, and I quote, the differential distribution of precariousness by such factors as class, citizenship, and race, end of quote. But <clears throat> even those cognizant of the distinction between precariousness as an existential condition and precarity as the differentially distributed forms of precariousness that characterizes the lives of underemployed workers, suffering bodies, or racialized citizens are increasingly blurring this distinction, it seems to me. Anat Singh's recent formulation is exemplary of this move, quote, once the fate of the less fortunate, now everyone's life is precarious, end of quote. 
As compelling as the expansive gesture might be towards capturing something specific to late capitalism and towards creating a sense of solidarity through reference to a shared global predicament, it ultimately stumbles upon a conceptual difficulty. The move to include every form of human frailty across all categories of difference runs the risk of flattening out the term until it loses analytic traction. So, for example, in a 2017 um, journal issue on Syrian refugees in Turkey, the editors who keep using precarity interchangeably with vulnerability end up having to resort to a new term floating around the scholarship, hyper-precarity. When the differential distribution of precariousness according to different degrees of privilege is alighted, everyone becomes precarious, the need then emerges to, des the need then emerges to designate those who are more vulnerable with boosted versions of the concept. Guided by these concerns, in this talk, I take the road of terminological delimitation rather than expansion to better capture the ways in which the legalization quest and work conditions of ethnically Turkish migrants from Bulgaria is imbued with precariousness. I do so not just for the sake of terminological puritanism, but such delimiting helps distinguish what is distinctive to the migrants from Bulgaria in relation to other undocumented migrants who struggle to survive in Turkey. So while my ethnographic focus is on this particular group, one, I have amassed intimate ethnographic knowledge of over the duration of six years of fieldwork, I also try to sustain a comparative lens showing how the predicament of the migrants from Bulgaria articulates with that of other undocumented in Turkey. And my knowledge of this latter group is based on what I have learned from NGO workers I have collaborated with over the years, colleagues working on these more vulnerable groups, and it's supported as well from the experience gleaned as an activist with the Migrant Solidarity Network in Turkey. Before I begin my delimiting moves, as I think of them, I want to give some background on the migrant landscape in Turkey in broad brush strokes, given constraints of time. <clears throat> so migration to Turkey has garnered a great deal of international attention lately, due for the most part to the Syrian refugee crisis and the controversial multi-billion euro deal between the EU and Turkey to halt the movement of Syrians from Turkey to fortress Europe. But in fact, Turkey's transformation into a country of immigration dates back to the late 1980s. The liberalization of the Turkish economy, the concomitant demand for cheaper informal labor, Turkey's laissez-faire approach to borders with ease of entry through sticker visas, um, though that ease has somehow somewhat been eroded due to recent EU harmonization and EU's externalization of the border. But all of that have resulted in unprecedented migration to Turkey in the past three decades. On the one hand, the breakdown of the Soviet bloc led to a predominantly feminized migration wave from the Soviet Union countries, former Soviet Union countries, first Moldova, Bulgaria, the Ukraine, then Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Georgia, and Armenia. Migrants from these countries mainly work as domestics, care providers, and occasionally as sex workers, trafficked or not. On the other hand, as a result of globally induced civil wars in Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan, migrants fled, usually with the goal of moving on to Europe, but often living a life in limbo of what was assumed to be transit turning into permanent stay in Turkey. Poverty, or simply prospects of better life opportunities, are driving migrants as well from sub-Saharan Africa to seek work in Turkey. By 2012, the unofficial estimate for undocumented migrants from such diverse geographical origins was between one and two million. That figure would rise to the level of more than three million people when Syrians fled anti-revolution repression following the civil war in Syria. So whether they struggle to reach Europe or to try to survive in Turkey, whether they fled war or whether they simply seek better opportunities, the majority of these refugees and labor migrants have no prospects of 
long-term legalization in Turkey, let alone citizenship. I can explain the technicalities of why that is uh, in the Q&A, but let me just maybe mention one thing that is peculiar to mm -hmm. the migration regime in Turkey. Although a signatory to the Geneva Convention, Turkey retains a geographic limitation, which means that it will only accept as refugees those who are from Europe. So that eliminates all the rest. The near absence of a path to citizenship sets these undocumented migrants apart from the ethnically Turkish migrants from Bulgaria, or as I will refer to them in the rest of my talk, keeping loyal to the emic usage, how they call themselves, Bulgaristanlı migrants. The latter have a historical foothold on citizenship. The foremost recipients of citizenship during the founding years of the Turkish Republic were migrants from the Balkans, and the Cold War reinforced the privileged treatment of these migrants from Bulgaria. So in 1989, for example, 300,000 were allowed into Turkey with much political fanfare <coughs> under the discourse of kin who are fleeing the oppression of a communist regime. Such preferential treatment has dwindled in the post-1990s, and this unconditional acceptance based on kinship is now mitigated by Bulgaristan migrants' market utility as informal labor and by transnational political considerations. It seems better to keep them in Bulgaria to advance the interests of the Turkish state in Europe. This is um, one view. So I describe this as a seesaw between um, the exploitative demands of the informal capitalist market and the assimilationist impulses of ethno-national appropriation. Like other undocumented migrants, therefore, the post-90s migrants from Bulgaria enter on three-month visa waivers, overstay their visas, and work in Turkey mostly as undocumented. Unlike other undocumented migrants, however, they have systematically had access to amnesties in Turkish off that grant them temporary residence but not work permits. And even as they join the rank of the undocumented in the informal labor market, mostly in domestic work, the Bulgaristan the migrants have the promise of citizenship. So the settlement law which regulates citizenship has uh, a statement that says individuals of Turkish origin should be accepted as migrants, and those who are accepted as migrants should qualify for citizenship on exceptional grounds. The relevant term here is soydash, which I translate as racial kin, um, which is a legal cultural category that derives from the Turkish state's historically exclusive preference for Sunni Muslim Turkish migrants. So Bulgaristan migrants are not the Iranian nationals who, after being caught at the Turkish-Greek border, were forced by Turkish police to swim back across the river to Greece, resulting in the drowning of five. Nor the Iraqis who were put in a bus by the Turkish gendarmerie and handed over to the authorities on the Iraqi side of the border. Nor the thousands of people apprehended each year and kept at overcrowded detention centers. But let us leave aside these more dramatic examples, which are also tricky because they prioritize crisis as spectacle, to use Fernando and Giordano's phrase, and deflect attention away from the more numerous migrants who are not deported, but kept in a condition of deportability and remain part of the cheap, dispensable labor force. The Bulgaristan are different from the latter because they're relatively privileged, both in terms of what's legally possible and intimated, even if not necessarily delivered, and in their formal and informal encounters with border officials, police, and the bureaucracy. This is not to conclude, however, that they are secure in their work and daily lives. Relative privilege does not eliminate precarity, but it does beckon us to modify, I think, its increasingly expansive deployment. So the first move I make is what I have called the etymological move. Here I recall the more archaic definition of precarious, namely, depending on the will or pleasure of another. This is the original usage to which Didier Fassin calls attention in his analysis of humanitarian government. The concept of precarious lives, Fassin writes, and I quote, needs to be taken in the strongest sense of his Latin etymology, 
lives that are not guaranteed but bestowed in answer to prayer or are defined not in the absolute of a condition but in the relation to those who have power over them. Following Fassan's semantic reminder and analytic perspective, I want to show in this section how precarity is enacted as the differential distribution of precariousness through the Bulgaristan the migrants' dependence on the acts, words, whims of structurally more powerful others, whether it's the police who might let them go or not without a bribe after a random ID check on the street, law enforcement who might or not cause difficulty at the border for a tourist visa, a school principal who might or might not agree to register children in the school. Being dependent on a more powerful other is not always identified or named as such, especially when it com comes under the guise of benevolence. Hatije, a Bulgaristan migrant in her 40s, told me that her daughter, who in turn is in her early 20s, used to work in a small textile shop. She worked informally, or as Hatija described it, as kachak, clandestine. The atelier was very close to where they lived. Someone must have reported them, Hatija said, because there was a police raid. Now I quote from Hatija. Everything about my daughter screams that she's not a local from how she dresses to how she moves around. But the police, they were honest folks. They turned out to be people with humanity. Do you have an ID, they asked her. She lied and said yes. They asked where, and she told them, at home. Call home, one of them said, and have someone bring it. She was terrified, but the boss <coughs> intervened. He said to my daughter, come on, go home, my girl, and come back here right away with your ID. And the police, they allowed her to leave. The moment she left, they said to the owner, look, of course we know she does not have an ID. They could easily have detained her, or they could have accompanied her home if they really wanted to check. In bestowing upon the officer the virtue of someone with humanity, Hatija personalizes and moralizes what might be called a strictly sociological situation in which the hierarchical relationship between the officer and the migrant annuls the possibility of reciprocity and obscures the structural violence that occasions the precarious predicament in the first place. When confronted with those who are at the edges of legality, the police have room to act in ways that are honest and full of humanity, or in ways that are gratefully perceived as such by those who are made to feel that precarious escape is the best chance. Looking the other way approximates the humanitarian gesture, one that sanctions an evasion of the law through the pres presence of compassion. As Fassin writes, quote, the tension between inequality and solidarity, between a relation of domination and a relation of assistance, is constitutive of all humanitarian government, end of quote. The police officer, which Hatija rendered as someone with humanity, enacts a politics of compassion, not unlike another police officer who obliged us by looking the other way when a TM and I went to the police station to inquire about an amnesty in June 2009. Atia was in her late 50s. She'd been engaging mostly in circular migration for five years at the time that I met her, working on and off as a nanny. Because she had family in Bulgaria, including a newly born granddaughter she doted on, she considered her work in Turkey temporary and took extreme care not to lapse into illegal status, something that became hard after the regulation allowing only 90 days of stay for every three months. Atia had found a way despite the new regulation since 2007, she'd been alternating with a co-villager, so each took a three-month turn to work for the same employer who agreed to the arrangement. On that day, we had gone to the police station to inquire whether Atsie could take advantage of the amnesty to gain an extra three months, even though she was still within her 90-day bracket. I made the inquiries, and Atsie stood without speaking. The police officer asked me, is she at the university too, like you, Hojam? And Hojam is like the conventional um, phrase used for anyone affiliated with the university. No, I replied, regretting the moments it came out of my mouth. He said, matter of, um, and I was caught off guard by his friendly manner, not something that I'm used to. He said, matter of factly, but you know it's forbidden. I know, I said, now extremely worried, dreading the consequences of my admission. He lowered his voice to a whisper, and I quote, so unfair that these folks do not get a work permit easily, so hard their situation. There, meaning in Bulgaria, they're persecuted because they're Turkish. Here, they're scorned as Bulgarians. 
An old uncle had come here once. I told him, sit down, tell me. He sat and cried and cried. All the things they had to endure just because they're Turkish, spoke Turkish, and because they prayed according to Islamic precepts, end of quote. Both official gestures of looking the other way, the first in the actual scene of breach of the law and the second in my confession of a breach of the law, present a further twist to the entanglement of humanitarian government with the politics of precarious lives. The destiny of the Bulgaristan migrant who works without a permit is dependent on the discretion of the official at the police station or the workplace. Such precariousness is abetted through the extended or perceived sentiment of compassion, one that is built on ethnic and religious kinship. So compassion is triggered not even because of one's universal humanity is exposed, but because the subject in question exhibits the right traits of Turkishness and Islam. Compared to most other undocumented in Turkey then, the Bulgaristan migrants have a better shot at benefiting from the politics of compassion, or for that matter, being the giver of bribes. But to the extent that the gesture is the primary escape that they rely on, they're precarious vis-a-vis -vis the law. So this precariousness that I describe is, I would argue, structurally different from the one undocumented Senegalese women testified to during a meeting bringing together various feminists, activists, and migrant women to forge a solidarity campaign against the systematic rape of African women by employers who reserve special rooms in the workplace for sex before paying the workers weekly earned wages. The perception of one as sexually available makes not just working but even walking on the street dangerous. As one Senegalese woman put it, the moment I walk, I'm game for anyone on the street. They assume I'm out for sex and they just act on that. That also goes for the police. So whom can I turn to when the police is no different from these men? The common perception of some migrant women as sex workers or as sexually available coincides with Turkey's speedy transformation that I have described in the opening beginning with the 90s. With the co collapse of the communist bloc, there was an overwhelmingly feminized wave of migration to Turkey from the former Soviet Union countries. And the name Natasha became appropriated into the local lexicon as the term, and I quote, that marks women who arrive from the FSU with the assumption that they sell sex for money. So according to a women's rights report, the violence these migrants included face that these migrants face included police who harass women, take them under custody, ask for bribes, or deport them simply based on their looks. So against the background of the routinized sexual harassment of women from Africa and the former Soviet Union, Bulgaristan women can hold at bay the pervasive perception of migrant women as sex workers and even hope for leverage in their encounters with officials through the idiom of racial kinship, which also takes on gendered inflections and makes them more absorbable, as it were, in the national family. To sum up the main theoretical thrust of this first section, etymology does not give us the absolute truth about the meaning of a term, neither should it bind up the ways in which a word is to be deployed. However, etymology can offer hints for clarification. So while I acknowledge the common sense ways in which the precarious and precarity have come to permeate everyday language and even bureaucratic jargon to refer to all sorts of uncertainties and vulnerabilities, I reappropriate precarious as a concept through recalling its etymology. I rethink it as the formal and informal codification of the asking and bestowing of favors rather than rights, and as a condition that is different from the ontological vulnerability, this is a phrase used by Jonathan Lear in his Radical Hope, on which all life is ultimately founded. The etymological move to delimit precarity also allows me to encapsulate how Bulgaristan migrants are able to manipulate relations of dependence to greater degrees than other undocumented migrants from Africa, the former Soviet Union, and Syria. The latter's dependence on those who have power over them for their lives is far less mitigated, with much less room for maneuver even when relying on favors. So the next move is what I have called the affective move. 
In the previous section, I tried to give the notion of the precarious more position through the etymological cue the term provides. Another track that already has been taken by other scholars has been through delimiting the life world's precarity pertains to simply to work conditions and more specifically to flexible, contingent, irregular labor. In this section, I too focus the lens on where precarious life meets precarious labor. However, I do so in a more affective register than the simple descriptive move. My inspiration here comes from what Müllerbach and Shoshan have recently described as post-Fordist affects. The promise of security and predictability about the future was, according to Müllerbach and Shoshan, the essence of the Fordist vision, a vision that continues to compel people across the globe as they mourn its loss and yearn for its revival. The vignette to follow intends to foreground then this temporally relative and relational aspect of precarity, that something is precarious in comparison and maybe only in comparison to a prior state of more security. Sevdie, <laughs> in her 50s, <coughs> called me to say she had quit her last employer because she could no longer put up with the unending workday. Like the majority of the migrant women who are employed in domestic work, Sevdia was working as a nanny. Just when she thought she was done after putting the kids to sleep, cleaning up in the kitchen, preparing the six-year-old special lunchbox because he was allergic to several foods, the lady of the house would call down the stairs. She would take away all the moments of peace and quiet alone in her room that Sevdia had anticipated all day moments in which she would enjoy the most recent photos of her two-year-old granddaughter in Bulgaria. Please do not forget to iron my dress, the midnight blue one, and those new sheets that just got washed too while you're at it. It was not the work itself, but the never-ending nature of the work. It was not being able to say, this is my free time now. I don't know what got into me, Sevdia said, referring to the evening she finally quit. Maybe it had accumulated and I exploded, or maybe I was just too tired that day, but the words just came out of my mouth. I said, I thought I was done for the day. There was a moment of silence and then the ice cold retort. Who do you think you are? You are done when I tell you you're done. The thing that got to me most, Sevdia continued, is that I soothed her so many times when she was secretly crying because of trouble in the house with the husband. So the ice cold voice really offended me. As if we had not been intimate those four years, I spent at that house growing the kids. I cried all night in my room, but I had made up my mind. I went down to the breakfast table slightly late the next morning, my stuff all packed up. I think she knew the moment she saw me. She said, extra sweet, good morning, dear Sevdia, do you want some tea? I said, no Sevda Hanum, I'm leaving. Sevdia had worked in a textile factory in Bulgaria until the fall of communism. At the time of our conversation, her daughter were, was pursuing a degree in criminology and had a two-year-old child in Bulgaria. Making sure that, our that her daughter earned her degree was one of the primary reasons for Sevdia for coming to work to Istanbul. I worked under a boss in the factory too, she reminisced more than once, but when we talked to each other, when we addressed each other, when we sat down at the table, we were equal human beings. I respected him, he respected me, one could joke around. On another occasion, she had said, back in the days of communism, I knew there would always be bread to put on the table. I did not worry about getting sick, losing my job, not receiving my pay. Sevdia had again found a new employer. This time she'd be taking care of an infant. She was pleased with the salary they offered. There is one thing that upsets me though, she went on. The employer, she took away my passport. It stays with her and she gives it to me only on Sundays, on my day off, right before I leave the house. Every Sunday, I wait at the door for it, like a beggar. I mean, come on, if she were to work abroad herself, would she surrender her passport to someone? 
You know, I've kept quiet these past two weeks because I do not want to lose this job, and on the whole, the conditions are good, but I'll talk to her soon. This is not the kind of document that you just hand over. If she wants, I could give her a duplicate of my information, but I will not be begging for my own passport. This confiscation of the domestic workers' passports is actually widespread practice among employers in Turkey. In fact, in 2012, an entry on one of the most popular websites for moms consisted of recommendations for how to treat your child foreign's nanny. And this advice went viral. The fourth item on the list, which came after tips about finding the good fit and negotiating the mm. monthly salary, read, confiscate her passport immediately and lock it in a safe place. The ease with which such, such advice can be offered on one of the most popular mothering sites and that it is implemented in practice as the confiscation of safety as only legal document attests is a manifestation of the normalization of what Iwa Ong has called the housebound form of labor incarceration. But here I want to call attention to something else. Sevdiya's incipient refusal to accept that widespread practice. In fact, I was surprised to hear that Sevdiya handed over her passport in the first place. Several of the Bulgaristan women I got to know had a similar story of being asked for their passport. Not only did they not object, they expressed their outrage at this request. So when a, one of her employers asked Hatija for her passport, she told me she literally exploded with laughter right in the woman's face and retorted, oh, come on, Zainab them. do you not hear with your own ears how ridiculous you sound? That passport is my only identity here. If you traveled somewhere and you stayed with some people and they asked to keep your passport, would you just hand it over to them? You can't really be asking for what I think you're asking. Hatija's confidence and sarcastic performance seemed to have put her employer to shame. Hatija said that she went on to mumble something to the effect of how it was just advice that she had received from a friend. Um, but, oh, but no, of course, it should not be necessary in her case. This refusal to yield what has become the norm is among many acts through which Bulgaristan mm. migrants assert their entitlement. Their employers, too, sometimes with admiration, other times begrudgingly distinguish Bulgaristan migrants for their wisdom about a whole range of practices from hygiene to good mothering to equal gender relations, and more generally for taking an assertive stance. So even when expressing endearment with a particular employer, Bulgaristan migrants will often be vocal about the substandard conditions they routinely face. They consistently nudge their employers to apply for work permits on their behalf, even when this was bureaucratically near impossible. They were also usually more <coughs> selective in choosing an employer and try to negotiate slightly better workloads. This assertiveness and pursuing demands are not matters just of personal disposition, although they like to think of themselves that way. Often they will say, I'm the kind of person who will always be going after my rights. But expressed as an individualized trait, this is in fact a collectively shaped, owned, circulating utterance. The communist legacy, I go into detail elsewhere, grounds their sense of entitlement, um, an entitlement rooted in the past, as well as the expectation that better conditions should be possible. No matter how modified or strategically adorned their recollections of the communist ethos may be, um, their experience of precarity goes hand in hand with the sense of entitlement. So with the second delimiting move then, I suggest that precarity assumes a prior state of more certainty and security in contrast to which the current state <coughs> of being is more compromised and threatened. All right, so the third and final section um, is what I have tentatively called, and I'm not terribly happy with, either the, the term or even this whole section, it's the one I feel most ambivalent about, but I included it nonetheless and precisely perhaps because of my ambivalence, um, is the denormativizing move. The currently expansive usage of the term precarity also involves a normative gesture. It's been readily adopted into the language of social movements that imagine alternatives to the capitalist organization of the world. 
and it's called upon to do political work for those involved in collective organizing efforts, including um, at creating solidarities among migrant workers and disadvantaged citizens in the labor market to insist on the incipient connections that are obscured by capitalism's divide and rule logic between people's seemingly different situations within neoliberal modes of exploitation. So you might have come across the precarity map that links activists across Europe. There was an international meeting of the precaria in Berlin. There is, I think, even a saint of precarity that has become an icon in Italy to unite all workers. In these efforts to bring together differently positioned workers under the rubric of precarity, um, precarity also aims to offer a basis for a shared radical consciousness of our commonality as workers in an exploitative market. And here the hour ranges all the way from the undocumented to the semi-documented to blue collar citizens to academics who can rely less and less on job security. And in fact, I myself was passionately involved in exactly such an initiative with the Migrant Solidarity Network in Turkey, which while politicizing the plight of the undocumented in Turkey for the first time in its history when people weren't even aware of these distinctions, also sought to go beyond the migrant citizen dichotomy to point to our shared vulnerabilities as flexible and dispensable workers. Yet having grown slightly more wary of the ease with, such, with which such normative gestures are extended without adequate attention to how differentiated precarities trouble collective organizing and solidarities. In this last section, I de-link precarity as an analytic term from the political agenda it implicitly presupposes or explicitly advocates. And this is my last vignette. Nebaniye, a Turkish migrant from Bulgaria in her early 40s, is a mother of two. And she was outspoken and defiant about her 10 years of precarious legal status when I first met her in 2007. Quote, 10 years of uninsured work, easy for the tongue to utter, dile kolay, is how she said it. My children grew up here, they go to school here. For 10 years I toiled away here and I'm still nothing in this country, nothing. But I have put my mind to it, I will get the citizenship. It is my right after so many years of living and working here. During a later visit to her home when we were talking about her, her children and the prospects for their education, she referred to the foreigner's exam that non-citizens were eligible to take for university entrance. This is an exam known for being slightly easier than the national one. And she said, I don't even want that privilege. Um, my children can just take the regular exam and um, and they can study like everyone else. Let us just get the citizenship. I don't mind the rest. We too have Turkish blood in our veins. And gesturing animatedly to the map of Turkey hanging on the wall behind the dining table, she said, did I put this map up here for nothing? This vision of investment, virtuous sleep, and virtuous labor expressed in terms of national attachment rather than financial gain would accompany Nebania for some time to come. Three more years of cycles of hope, disappointment, and renewed hope later, Nebania was trying to absorb the disappointment of her most recent application falling through at the very last step. Exasperated by the whims of the legal system, but undaunted, she recounted the last anticlimactic step. Quote, so we go to the civil registry to give our signatures. When calling to notify us of this final appointment, they had even said, congratulations, can you believe it? Anyway, they we are, there we are working through the last document with the clerk, and then this couple comes in looking all upset. How come our application was rejected, they ask. The clerk tells them their application is based on the companion permit, which you get through your children enrolling in school. And the clerk tells them applications based on the companion permit are not valid anymore. Ahmed, her husband, and I glance at each other with alarm. The clerk catch catches our glance. Is yours also based on the companion permit? She asks, what can we say? We say yes. Then I cannot go through with this application. I won't put the stamp on it. And that's it. We ask for what we can do. Nothing, she says. Companion permits are not valid anymore. 
but I'm not giving up, so I finally asked my distant cousin to help, the doctor you know. So we go again together, the doctor Ahmed and me. My cousin introduces him help himself at the do as the doctor at the so-and-so hospital, and we go directly to the chief's office. To totally different treatment, of course. And the chief, he felt bad for us. I could see it. He said to my cousin, of course, I too would prefer citizens like these. Naturally, he does not want all those people coming from Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan and whatnot. Of course, he wants us instead. Anyway, the chief said, there's nothing I could have done. It's the regulation, but there may be a way around it. And he explained it, and now we're working on it. In her persistence and her protest, Nebania alludes to two grounds on which the migrants from Bulgaria pursue their claims. One appeals to territorial presence and the act of labor. For 10 years, I toiled away here. The other involves identifying with the favored citizenry, which is subject to positive prejudice through the shared dominant ethnicity. Naturally, he prefers people like us. In Nebania's appeal, the first possibility was quickly abandoned in favor of the second. So this steering away from a broader identification as an undocumented migrant and towards claiming the distinction of being Bulgaristan or Turkish is, a, is common to the migrants I met during my field work. This is a very different strategy than asserting territorial presence and labor as the justification for rights claims, which is most famously how the Saint-Papier in France formulated their demands. By contrast, the Bulgaristan migrants anchor their entitlement within an appeal to the ethnicity privileged by Turkish, Turkey's citizenship mm -hmm. regime. It might be tempting to reduce Nebania's read readiness to latch on to the favoritism of the official to a self-interested reproduction of discrimination or to characterize her choice to pursue the privilege of ethnic identity rather than the shared exigencies of undocumented labor as politically conservative and as discriminatory. And these evaluations would not be entirely wrong. However, instead of stopping at that, I ask why the idiom of ethno-national identification is by far the discursive strategy with greater political and moral purchase. Why do Nebania and other Bulgaristan migrants appropriate the politically narrower language of ethnic privilege rather than join the more inclusive language of territorial presence as the basics for forging claims as laborers? Elsewhere, I've considered the dearth of institutional channels through which undocumented migrants could advance more substantial collective claims. For example, existing NGOs in Turkey usually delimit their work with migrants to refugees only. A second structural impediment is the near indifference um, or even hostility of oppositional groups and most importantly, trade unions to undocumented migrants and trade unions in fact have occasionally partaken in nationalist rhetoric perceiving migrant labor as a threat. But in addition to all these more visible structural impediments, a less articulated difficulty to the forging of alliances and one that emerges uh, ethnographically is different expectations, risks and among uh, priorities among the migrants themselves. The reason why the ultimate balance tips in the favor of ethnic kinship and not territorial presence also has to do, I suggest, with the production of different precarities and different kinds of hope, as I elaborate in the book. This is indicative, of course, of a broader problem of fostering solidarity amid self or family interest. But I want to take more seriously the dynamics of that tension between collective solidarity and self-interest as it plays out according to divergent and structurally differentiated experiences of precarity. Attending ethnographically to the differentiated nature of precarity might be politically useful as well in addressing the rifts, not just in Turkey, but across the globe between, on the one hand, positing precarity as an umbrella concept by labor movements and the frustrating indifference of some of the groups they target to join those movements. I am aware of the danger. As I denormativize, I risk to depoliticize. And there is no quick way out of this conundrum. However, here I sought to trouble the hopes put into precarity as 
a point as a rallying point to collectively fight exploitative working conditions. I've suggested that unless we fully reckon with the differentiated nature of precarity, which the ethnographic lens facilitates, such abstracted generalized calls to a collective sense of solidarity through pointing out how we're all vulnerable under capitalism have lesser chance of success. A final thought before I conclude. Recognizing relative privilege also relies, or also entails, sorry, not relying on the moral ground that accompanies writing about those who are the most downtrodden or the most dispossessed. If the interrogation of the ways in which the ethnographer, the analyst, or the activist may unwittingly piggyback on one's interlocutor's deprivations towards claiming a certain moral authority for one's own agenda, writing about relative privilege bring its own set of challenges. One particular challenge for me has been to do justice to the coexistence of privilege and precarity or to relative privilege in precarity. More specifically, how does one avoid minimizing the vicissitudes faced by Bulgaristan migrants without lapsing into the undifferentiated account of the vulnerable migrant? How does one properly acknowledge relative privilege without depicting Bulgaristan migrants and other similarly positioned groups as more powerful than they actually are, holding on to remnants of privilege in an unreliable, unjust world is, after all, also an act of survival. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me here for a fascinating talk. I um, was going to start by discussing the fact that I know very little about uh, Bulgarian migration to Turkey, and yet I think the fact that I know little is a good um, indication of some of the issues of relative privilege um, that Aisha's paper pointed out, the way in which uh, when I read about Turkish migration in the newspaper, it is going to be uh, the most oppressed, the, the, the most downtrodden, and preferably the most graphic um, depiction of that form of migration. And it also, I think you did a really good job, um, or maybe you helped me a lot, to think through the way in which we use precarity in our own lives, and it's quickly followed by guilt. Um, as we talk about our own precarious lives, our precarious jobs, and then I also do work with uh, Nepali asylum seekers and suddenly realize that using the same word for those two things um, really troubles me. And so thus the idea of thinking through relative privilege has really helped me a lot and I'm looking forward to, to reading more on that. I wanted to talk about a few things because I have very little to say about Turkish-Bulgarian migration, um, but I wanted to focus on precarity and hope um, from a couple of different perspectives. The first thing I wanted to start uh, with is to think about, and we'll see if I, how many of these I get to, um, what are sometimes called street-level bureaucrats or also middlemen. I was really moved, or if you're a South Asianist, a Dalal. Um, I was really influenced by a 2012 special issue of Pacific Affairs called Opening the Black Box of Migration where they talk about the ways in which migration is often talked about as a start point and an end point. And the mediators who bring those people together are bad. That's really all that we need to know is that they're bad and exploitative. And also the assumption that's often as part of migration is that permanent settlement is the goal. And as your paper suggested, I think we're seeing more and more circular migration where nation states continue to be anxious about um, permanent settlement, um, even as migrants may not actually desire that. Uh, the next thing I wanted, uh, I hope, we'll, hopefully we'll get to talk about, is the tension between bureaucracy and sympathy, which I see in your paper, the way in which there's um, throughout um, Aisha's work a sort of 
concern on the one hand of the inadequacy of the bureaucracy to support these migrants, and on the other hand, their need to rely on sympathy or empathy or other forms of social attachment. Um, and I'm probably gonna spend more time on the second because it's what I'm struggling with right now. Um, in what I've seen of migration, governments, global, global governments, and NGOs in particular, are really striving for fairness and transparency in migration. Um, they understand, again, the exploitation that is a part of this and want to make it um, more fair. Um, and yet, I've also come to think about transparency as a problematic word, as a very untransparent word that what transparency is is not altogether clear and to what, what to one migrant might be transparent might be opaque to the next. So that's what I wanna talk about is that sort of the role of global governance and NGOs in pushing for fairness and transparency in a way that actually might disadvantage people that they're not thinking about or looking at. Um, I shall also mention the amazing work of Millar and Muehlbach uh, both of whom are cr critiquing the critique of precarity, um, which I also want to bring in thinking through the way in which this is a word that um, too often, well, that, that intuitively has a negative sense to them. And Millar in particular shows how for some precarity can be good, can be a positive thing, can be an advantageous thing. Aisha does really valuable work in what she's presented today, and I hope we get to read it soon because it's one of the things that it takes several readings to digest. Um, in terms of the various uses of precarity, looking at its history and its relationship with late capitalism, as well as the sort of wider philosophical discussion of the precarious. Um, and I was surprised that the one word that never came up was the, the precariat because I, at least I see the, the nominalization of that um, as happening more and more. And yet, you begin your paper by saying the real danger here is that if everybody is precarious, then it's really pretty a meaningful ter meaningless term. Um, so I actually liked most, I just turn towards the etymological focus. Um, wanting to, she wants to look at both the concept and the word precarious and drawing a lot from Didier Fassian's idea of the precarious as related to dependence. So this is when I'm gonna to try to get into the idea of sympathy. In Aisha's words, quote, dependence on the, it, in Aisha's words, the precarious is dependence on the words, acts, whims of the structurally more powerful others. They might actually be quoting Fassian at that point in time. But here's where I return to Millar's work on Brazilian garbage dump sorters. This is what she is talking about when she's, I'll say it, rehabilitating precarious work. Um, she talks about how, um, and I think you also speak about this, um, for some informal, even unsafe work, work in the waste dumps of Rio offers some advantages that former labor doesn't that there might be such a thing as good precarity um, and that the sort of fetishization of a um, fortis form of labor uh, might be getting in our way a little bit. Likewise, and in maybe my own moment of what um, uh, Aisha sets up an idea of goal-oriented versus open-oriented hope, which I liked a lot and I don't <coughs> think she mentioned, but I'm going to talk for a moment of open-ended hope and end up with goal-oriented. Um, in a moment of open-ended hope, I wonder if there are moments when informality of migration can offer opportunities that formalization could not for some. Um, again, the rise of circular migration, the nationalist anxiety of residents, the fear of overstaying, which are the anxieties of the nation state and not always the desires of the migrant. Now, I don't think that this is something that um, Aisha's paper foreclosed it all, but I want to highlight it because I'm familiar with how attempts at increasing fairness, transparency, justice, and dependability of, of migration advantage some and disadvantage others. Um, the nuance of Aisha talks about her subjects is really wonderful, and 
you discover that these are really savvy navigators of the fields that they're in. It's an ever-changing, constantly rumored shift Every rule that exists could change tomorrow, and these are actors who really have their finger on the pulse. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on. Of, Did you hear, are they changing the rules? Is it gonna be three months or six months? They have their ears to the ground about um, when to show up. Sometimes they're wrong, but they're part of a very close-knit community. And this is where I wanna sort of bring the possibility of dependence back in as a positive, because their dependence on one another to know the rules, which are incredibly flexible, they're not transparent, um, is very important to them. Unfortunately, they also have to spend a lot of time chasing this ever-changing list of rules only to find out that they are not enforced at all or not evenly enforced. But for lots of the people you talk to, they're chasing the rules, but they're chasing them through informality. They're chasing them through social connections. Um, in my own work on migration to South Korea, I've seen residents of the global south, and particularly Nepal, navigate an incredibly complex bureaucratic system in order to migrate. And the entire South Korean system is based upon maximizing transparency and fairness. In fact, in 2014, 2013, they received the UN award for the fairest and most transparent migration system. Um, congratulations. And it's completely fair and transparent. If you can read English, if you have a passport, um, if you can understand bureaucracy, it would be nice if you had a couple of degrees. The system is transparent maybe to us in a university setting, but in Nepal it's certainly only transparent to those with connections within the transparent bureaucratic system. People who are familiar with forms and stamps and bureaucracy and testing and all of these things that the UN sees as bringing transparency to the migration system. But for another group of Nepali migrants, and these are the migrants who are currently um, dying at a rate of 2.2 per day and building the World Cup in Dubai, or the World Cup Stadium in Dubai, um, the Dalal system, that, that um, middleman system, is much more transparent to them. They understand what happens. The, the Korean system is completely opaque, but the social connections of friends, I had a cousin who went through this route, I, I know these techniques, they can be deadly. These people are well aware of the fact that they could die in this system, but it is transparent, AKA something that they can understand and see through in a way that the Korean system isn't. So I wanna think about um, the ways in which, and perhaps I get to have particular fun saying this in the midst of a law school as an anthropologist, you know, to what degree the more that we increase the, what we hope to be the fairness and transparency of migration laws, Who's left out of that system? Who's, who's being disadvantaged by these changes, even as other people might be advantaged? What really struck me about many of those that Aisha spoke to was not as much their precarity, but sort of their, their strategic links in an ever-changing field. I mean, one of their key tools in navigating this is links to Bulgaria, to Turkey, beyond that system, their links to you, to NGOs, all of those sorts of things. So with that, I wanna turn to affect and relationality. Um, I'm glad you pointed out, and, and I now wanna know the exact details, that most of the migrants you're talking about are women. Um, they were in your description, but you never said they're mostly women. Um, most of these women who are seeking to maintain their employment in Turkey are the ones that have their she described, I'm wondering if this is a, a term, ear to ear. They have the most ear to ear connections where they're listening to each other and using family members to solve problems. I'm glad you talked about Atilye, um, who was using her, using her. The co-villagers were, were solving a problem. They had, the, their problem was that they had to get out of the country every 90 days. Their employer's problem was that they needed constant workers they solved a problem, and they solved it through sociality. They solved it through connections. They solved it through sympathy. They solved it through all of these affective dimensions. Um, 
But in most of the examples that Dr. Parlin notes, affect, compassion, solidarity are deployed by people in, in powerful relations, are deployed by authorities as a depoliticizing contrivance and as a means of might be an exaggeration of what you said, but I thought of it as turning rights into privileges. Things that people should just have were turned into privileges for, again, the anthropologist in me said, ah, oh, yes, it's Moses the gift. Um, it's creating bonds and creating supplicants with people who will forever be attached to these uh, bureaucrats rather than them merely dis you know, discharging their duties. A couple of things I wanted to think about in relationship to that, and, and I think there's some irony in the fact that um, I remember hearing Inderpal Grewal talk, not in this room, but in this um, setting about humani humanitarian citizenship and the universal humanity that is often appealed to that Grewal thinks is now coming through NGOs and coming through our obligation to help not everybody can afford. Um, and I thought that was very useful as, as well to think through this paper. The other thing I wanted to talk about in relationship to um, the problem of solidarity was Judith Butler's discussion of, of strategic alliances and their breakability, um, that maybe the solidarity thing wasn't such a problem. Um, I was struck by how many adult migrants had their own mobility and connections facilitated by children. Not merely the ones that they cared for, and this is in the companion rule, but you know, through school connections, through their legitimacy as parents of children in schools. And again, thinking of who loses out in this system, non-breeders lose out in this system. Think about all of the advantages. Um, uh, what was her name? Atelier would not have had this opportunity if she didn't have a cousin who also had a child who they could trade off childcare. So these things that are very um, liberal, very advantageous to one group, disadvantage another one. So with states of exception and precarity becoming, um, as Parla describes, and I, I concur, often so broad as to become meaningless, um, those that she speaks with are left with only one thing, the certainty of uncertainty, which reminded me of known unknowns. Um, it's from here that Aisha gets cautiously and with skepticism to hope. Hope that this is a new uncertainty, a new regulation, a new rumor that her subjects think might be better. Maybe the next rumor will be good. Maybe this hope, but probably isn't, um, going to be better for us. It's sort of an everyday indeterminacy. Maybe, just maybe, this time they won't mess it up as much as they did the last time. And Aisha also returns to familiar literatures on the genesis of modern precarity. Um, she notes that those who once had stability um, are the ones that are the most shocked and destabilized by what feels to them a new uncertainty and risk, Muehlbach. Um, but I also wonder if those are the th way things never were, which is the greatest title of a book ever. It tells the whole story about the 1950s and the way in which our imagination of a 1950s where women didn't work in America statistically was not true. So ours is the nostalgia, and I wonder if now the sort of introduction of the communist connection changes that a little bit, but is that nostalgia for a non-precarious past, perhaps a nostalgia quite literally for something that never was. Um, so with that depressing thought, um, I wanted to open things up to uh, a question to Dr. Parla about the merits of hope and connection that I've been hinting to. Um, I can't give up hope. Literally, I'm having a hard time giving up hope. I'm teaching a class on hope because I keep trying to figure it out myself in this day and age. Um, to quote uh, Aisha quoting others, and this is like an amalgam of four different people, quote, uncertainty is a social resource. It can call forth considered action to change both the situation and the self. It can be productive of hope. That uncertainty and precarity, there could be something good there. And then she quotes Carol McGranahan where she says that it can combine with the will to refuse authorized anticipations and thus move away from the probable into the possible. 
yay, uncertainty, finally something, new horizons of expectations, maybe we can move from the probable into the possible. But I want to suggest that the blurring that, that I should describe between goal-oriented and open-oriented hope and ethnography may also be characteristic of the 21st century, of late liberalism, where we have yet to figure out what to feel in light of impossible goals, unsolvable problems. I mean, I'm currently working on unexpungible waste, stuff that just can't get away. It's not going to go away. And to ambivalence about solidarity and connections, the ties that bind and are nearly always uneven ways that we are bound together. I'm stubbornly unwilling to give that up. Yes, our effective connections are our downfall and turn what should be rights for many of the people she talks to into ties that bind. But I went back because you quote her several times and, and um, you know, she's of course around often. Um, Katie Stewart's description of the hard precarity of unworlding that occurred when her father died to her mother. And yet, exactly that sort of pain, that destabilization, reminds us that we're in the world. With all its pointy corners and unseen pits, when we lose people and experience that precarity, we had them once. And I'm pretty sure that I trust that a little bit more than bureaucracy. Because I know if I hit one of those pointy corners or if I fall down the well, it'll be Lassie who will get me out, not the bureaucracy. So thank you. So I'm, I'm torn between my urge to respond right away because that was so rich and provocative, but also not wanting to monopolize. And I want to hear what other people have to say. Maybe, okay, maybe I'll do is to just pick one thing for now, which doesn't, and not in any hierarchical order, but something that um, seemed to tie some of the suggestions you raise with the paper, and that's your more than me, more optimistic or enthusiastic or favorable outlook to uncertainty predictability as opposed to transparency and uh, fairness, as you called it. Transparency and fairness aren't the terms in, in terms of the uh, legal sphere in Turkey right now in relation to migration, but I think what you're saying does translate in terms of more regulation, more written down rules versus more ad hoc, unpredictable, um, arbitrary spheres. And the kind of arguments um, has been made that in fact, precisely the unregulated nature of Turkey's migration regime, although that has changed a bit since 2014 with, with the law on the protection of foreigners, but this was the first attempt to regulate migration. So Turkey was actually pretty unique that there was no unifying body of law on migration and you just had these disparate kinds of international um, laws that Turkey had signed on to plus local rules, uh, laws like the settlement law or citizenship law, but no separate migration law. And people drew on these together to make decisions. Part of it is that one could say Turkey was caught off hand by turning suddenly into a country of um, immigration and the law didn't catch up. But of course, I think that being caught off guard did its own work. It was useful from a labor market perspective that one did not have to regulate and decide and would, one could accept all these migrants coming in because there was obviously demand for them. They did the work that other people weren't willing to do and they worked under exploitative conditions and the state could just sort of let all that happen without having to resort to a, ouch. That's, so working <laughs> against uncertainty and predictability. Uh, they could, um, they could, uh, so, so the argument has been made 
Juliet Tolai, for example, has this paper where she says that in fact Europe should take as a model Turkey's unregulated migration regime because it actually offers migrants more room for maneuver precisely in those um, unregulated, <coughs> uncodified spaces migrants can negotiate better for their positions. I tend to disagree with that view for two reasons. One, I think that kind of deregulation all too easily plays into the hands of a arbitrary regime where one um, keeps this kind of flexible labor without having to then figure out how to grant rights or give entitlements. So that kind of uncertainty, while it may seem to give people more room to navigate, also becomes a very um, convenient tool for the government or for employers to exploit workers. I also think, to further that thought, while I would agree with you perhaps more that that kind of room for maneuver that comes from deregulation, non-transparency, these kinds of rumors that one then picks up and which gives them leverage in negotiating with a bureaucrat saying, well, but it doesn't write that anywhere. Couldn't you just do it for me? And sometimes they get away with it. Does two things. It advantages those who have personal savvy. So the women who is very outspoken, confident, who feels she can walk into an office, does it while another who is more timid and who doesn't trust herself. So it then puts the burden on individual savvy. And I think structurally, groups with relative privilege tend to benefit fr more from that kind of deregulation ambiguity. And those who are really um, suspect and dispossessed, like the ones who are put in detention centers, get completely screwed by it because there is no time cap on how much they're going to be detained, that kind of arbitrariness works their disadvantage. So yes, I mean, I, I see the value of it, but I'm also wary. And then one point about Millar's work, which I also very much like, because like you say, she's really re, revalorizing precarity and saying that these people in Brazil appropriated as something that is in fact a kind of autonomy over otherwise unpredictable lives. Um, but in the presentation, I didn't go into it. In the paper, I also discuss how my take on it is different from Millar. Again, in the sense that the people that she's looking at are people who are in absolute poverty. So in a way, yes, she's showing the agency they have over those precarious conditions, but what else do they have? They're really already at the bottom. And whereas I'm talking about people who are coming from a position of relative privilege. And so they don't adjust to the conditions of precarious work as Millar's garbage collectors do, not because they're less adaptable perhaps, or not because they're not able to agentically appropriate precarity, but they already feel more entitled to a sense of security and predictability. Okay, I'll leave it at that because I want to hear what other people have to say. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering, you were talking about uh, mainly female persons migrating to Turkey. I was wondering what happened to the males. Do they stay in those countries? Do they move somewhere else? The um, men? Yeah. I mean, depends <laughs> which men we're talking about. But um, in terms of um, staying or moving on, I'm trying to think whether there is a major difference between men and women? I mean, I think it, it's hard to answer this question categorically from distinguishing, by distinguishing between men and women. I think it depends where people are coming from. So a lot of male migration from Afghanistan, um, Iran, and Iraq was undertaken with the intention to then move to Europe. And they either could not or ended up 
settling. They might have uh, applied for refugee status because although I mentioned that Turkey will not grant them refugee status, what happens is there is a UNHCR in Turkey, which is very interesting from a legal perspective. So my um, NGO friends at Helsinki Citizens Assembly have explained this to me. It's like a dual system where you cannot apply for refugee status in Turkey, but you apply to the UNHCR in Turkey, which goes through your application and it, they decide if you qualify as a refugee, then a third country has to take you in. You cannot be settled in, in Turkey. So a lot of people, the men who have come from these countries fleeing war or discrimination or violence have applied and some will not have their applications approved. So then they just stay on. If they get their application through, they will move on. And the women from the former Soviet Union are likely to either already come with the intent of engaging in circular migration, as, as Heather rightly pointed out, or they come with the intent of them bringing their families and to settle. But I'm not sure if this would hold categorically across all groups. I don't know if I could make a generalizable claim about the difference between men wanting to move on and women coming to settle or vice versa. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, so, we've been talking about the troubled relationship between privilege and solidarity. So, if on one side you have the um, Bul Bulgaristan migrants who, um, out of, I don't want to say self interest, but you know, because of their position, um, aren't going to be <coughs> the ones at the front of the protest and aren't um, going to be joining the solidarity movements, and then on the other side you have um, this kind of solidarity push for like bigger policy change, where would someone like, and I'll use um, Professor Hinman's term, savvy navigator, someone like you when you go with, um, with a migrant to an office and you have um, the privilege of your, your job, your status, your race, whatever it is, um, so I see that as kind of a, a savvy navigator. You can go with that person and use that privilege as a form of solidarity. Where does that fall on the, the spectrum? Do you see that as part of a solidarity movement or are you still, and I don't mean to use you as an example, but someone No, please who do. <laughs> That's what we do as anthropologists. <laughs> someone who uses their privilege um, for the sake of solidarity, um, is that just perpetuating the the bigger issue of, mm. um, you know, using race and privilege, or mm. it, where do you see that mm. falling on that? No, it's, it's a great question. Shall I go ahead or take more? Yeah. Okay. Well, anthropologists are infamous for talking on and on about their positionality and doing all this self-reflexive work, so your question allows me to do that, which I haven't done that much yet. Um, so on the one hand, I was tremendously happy that I was able to use to some extent my dubious privilege as a professor in the academia for these migrants when I went. I say dubious because most of the time I don't think I had much capital with these bureaucrats and officers. I think I was too young, I was a woman, they weren't quite convinced I was a professor, even if they were, given the anti-intellectualism we have in Turkey, similar to what's going on here now, it's not necessarily the most respect commanding thing to be an academic. So if you're a doctor or a lawyer, that's something else. But a professor, it really depends. It doesn't have the cultural capital that it once had. Nonetheless, of course, it did um, help that I could look through um, documents that sometimes I had a hard time to navigate, but I could still do it, I, you know, and, and my interlocutors really wanted me. So whether it made a real difference or it just helped them psychologically to have someone as we waited in lines, most of my ethnography is waiting in lines. Um, and and so, so, I was grateful for that because that relieves the anthropologist's guilt 
of lack of reciprocity in research where we too often feel like we take, take, take from our interlocutors. We take their words, we take their actions, we turn them into books, and no matter how much justice we try to them, it's ultimately our book that we write about them. And this way of um, framing the field was at least one in which I felt that I was useful at least from their eyes. So I could use whatever trace of privilege I had to go um, to to you know give something back to them, and they summoned me. They texted me. They said, "Come with me tomorrow when I have to get in line. Come with me. You speak better to this person." And you know, so so from a methodological perspective, and in terms of relations of reciprocity, and what Marcus has recently called epistemic partnerships, though I don't know if this is, well, it was a partnership, and it was epistemic partnership in the sense that sometimes they would explain the bureaucracy to me much better than I was able to figure it out on my own. So I learned a lot from their explanations of what all these complicated um, bureaucratic amnesties meant. Um, I think from that angle, uh, I was very happy about it. Now, but, but I think you point to a more troubling part in your question in a way by helping this one individual Bulgaristan migrants, where I argue on their behalf, based on this privilege of racial kinship that ultimately excludes and disadvantages other migrants, am I not in part perpetuating the hierarchy between different migrants and the system that only favors the preferable, desirable migrant at the expense of others? And Yes, of course. I mean, in one of the applications that we were writing for Hidmi uh, Hanum, this last step where she was doing the citizenship petition, we went to the Migrant Association, and, and I remember asking them, so what should we write? And this association representative said, well, anything you can write about your relatives who might have acquired citizenship, their religiosity, all those will help. And so then Hidmi Hanum wrote about it, and she didn't believe it herself, but her commitment to Turkey as a nation, you know, all this stuff that reinforces a very ethnic nationalism was in there and I helped her write it and yes, of course, so I did. That's why in part I was, I think, doing the migrant activist work that had the opposite discourse, no nation, no borders, doesn't matter who you are, but I think part of the tension I'm struggling with that if I were only doing the other and not being in relations of reciprocity or solidarity with my interlocutors in this way, I would also have felt less useful. So there is a bind there. You say that some of the issues with the Bulgaristan law and other migrants to Turkey uh, are a result of uh, of what you refer to as late capitalism. Uh, could you explain what exactly you mean when you use this term, um, especially in the context of Turkey? Uh, and also, um, how would you respond to, say, um, an economist who might argue that many of the issues of precarity come from uh, an overregulation uh, and restriction of immigration, uh, in a sense, not enough capitalism, and not issues inherent to capitalism? OK, um, am I speaking to an economist, then? No. <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure, yeah, I'm not sure where you pulled the quote from, but I think um, the reference to capitalism is not my reference per se. It is a genealogy of the term precarité in terms of how it refers to conditions of unpredictable, insecure, contingent labor that have been exacerbated by late capitalism. Now, of course, there is an argument that is made, which um, Heather also pointed out, that the Fordist dream was that, a dream, and early capitalism, or, you know, that, that there was really mm -hmm. not much difference. Um, so there are two things I think one could do with that argument. So one could maybe remove the qualifier late capitalism and think of precarity as a feature of capitalism in general and, alter and imagine alternative forms like communism that maybe was less precarious. Now the objection might be, and I think you raised that, but is that nostalgia? And 
a chapter I have is called Nostalgia as Hope. And there I go into what nostalgia means. I mean, usually nostalgia is taken to be this thing that is strategically remembered in the present. It's a statement about the present rather than being a claim about really what happened in the past. And I kind of argue both ways. I mean, so the Bul so when I think with the Bulgaristan and migrants, really positive recollections of communism. I mean, it's very rare to come across one Bulgaristan and migrant who will say anything bad about communism, and especially women. So they'll talk about how they had job security, how if you have, when after birth, you have three years of um, secured work. Two of those were paid, and you know, and. And more than that, the gender relations. So they're aghast at the kinds of impositions men have over women in Turkey and how they you know, treated or were treated in the house as much more equals. And they attribute all of that to the communist ethos. And, and the argument I make there is twofold. So one, I say, yes, of course, it is partly strategic. It's a way of saying, don't discriminate against me. It's a way of claiming dignity. It's a way of asserting who they are, avoiding the, um, the accusation that they're wayward women who work and don't like properly adhere to Turkish norms and customs of morality. So they say, look, this was communism. This is how we are. We have dignity. We have respect. So it is strategic in that sense. But I don't reduce it to just strategic remembrance. I think there was in communism certain kinds of lived experiences that make them feel more entitled to a better condition of work in the house and uh, uh, at home. Um, so, oh, and the other, um, yeah, so I guess what I was going to connect it to, um, to Heather's comment about, is it a dream, was it real? I think it's important, the distinction, in a way, maybe it might be less trivial to how I'm thinking of precarity as assuming a prior state of security, because even if it is one that is conjured, adorned, modified, its very existence and remembrance as a prior state, that's the affective part for me. And I think for Mühlebach and Shoshan in their formulation, that is critical. So yeah, thank you for also allowing me to go back to um, Heather's point. Hi, so um, I found it really interesting how you talked about how ethnic affiliation mm. can lead to a certain amount of privilege mm. for um, Turkish, Bulgarian Turkish migrants. Mm. And I was just wondering where um, Islam comes into that. Like, <laughs> is there a certain amount of like racialized religion in Turkey where um, I guess people, migrants from like Senegal or Central Asia aren't considered Muslim enough because of their race or ethnicity and therefore any discrimination against them is fair game. Great question. So if you go back to the early founding years of the Republic and look at um, the discussions in the Parliament, which I did, but I also rely on colleagues in history who have looked at the archives, it's fascinating when th they're trying to pin down what racial sameness, what Turkishness means. Um, and you see a tug of war between those who want to prioritize Islam, anyone who is Muslim, by the way, there is a sectarian difference. So Alawi won't do the cut, so you have to be Sunni Islam for sure. So there are those who want to prioritize Islam as the um, most important component of racial affinity. And there are those who want to prioritize ethnicity, Turkishness. So. Um, it is being Turkish, speaking Turkish, that matters. But then when you look at how that category, because the definition in the settlement law is only those who are of Turkish origin, and the word used is race. So they debate which word shall we use race, shall we use culture, they go with race, and then they add culture. But race is there, right? Of the Turkish race, only those will be accepted into the nation state. 
One should also remember, of course, that this is on the heels of the Armenian genocide, which eliminated drastically the non-Muslim population in Turkey. And so you also have what I call these gastronomic kinds of formulations where members of parliament are talking about the need to devour more people to sustain the stomach of the nation, right? So there is an eliminated um, contingency, and they're trying to decide who is the best group to then bring in and assimilate. And so the people of Turkish race and of ties to Turkish culture, that's the legal formulation. Then you know someone asks, well, who are we go going to call Turkish? Are Jews Turkish? And they're like, no, of course not. So you, so you look at how they're describing this term by saying who is not in. And now you can also look at what they actually do when they implement the policy. So for example, um, there is a group called the Gagos who are Christian, but who speak Turkish, they're not accepted into citizenship. So there you see that even though there is an emphasis on culture and language, a group who's not Muslim doesn't make the cut. So it's, it's kind of this um, tug of war between whether religion or ethnicity is more important, but the ideal combination is those who can bring both together. The case of Syrian refugees is interesting because the current president is playing up their religious identification to call them, there is a technical term, an ensar, like this, um, this brotherhood that harkens back to a shared Ottoman past based on religion. And I was even wondering, are the Syrians going to emerge as yet another group with relative privilege because they are being claimed and appropriated through this religious brotherhood? But it hasn't quite caught on among the public who's extremely hostile to Syrian refugees in ways that they never are to the Bulgaristan. At worst, they'll call the Bulgaristan, OK, they're not Muslim enough, they eat pork, or their women are too easygoing and they dress in miniskirts and how shocking but they will not be that hostile to them as they are to the Syrians. So that kind of appropriation work with the Syrians as our religious brothers hasn't quite worked in the way that it has with um, Bulgaristan. One of the response papers had asked me, so can you do a hierarchy of which migrants are where in the spectrum? And I do a little bit of that. I call it the hierarchy of migrant desirability. It's not set in stone, but by looking at who is accepted when and who is not, uh, when you can sort of trace a trajectory, and again, it changes. I mean, with this government, I think religion is on the rise in terms of its balance vis-a-vis -vis ethnicity. Um, I think everybody's, is it on? Yes. Okay, everybody's getting tired, so I'll try to make it short. But, um, so you made a couple of references in your examples to um, networks among circular migrants and also uh, connections to more well-established uh, Bulgarian relatives who have perhaps been in Turkey longer and had citizenship or the yes. doctor. Yes. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the role of earlier Bulgarian Turkish immigrants to Turkey, particularly those who came in the 90s or even earlier in earlier. the 30s and have, uh, you know, have, have citizenship. What, what's their role in you know, these temporary undocumented workers' negotiation of uh, their rights and yeah. uh, their stay there. Yeah, great question. I mean, migrant networks are always interesting to map patterns of migration, and usually when they're earlier arrivals, that sets its own dynamic with any migrant group. But in the case of the Bulgaristan, though, of course, it has added importance because of this legacy of favoring migrants from the Balkans. And I referred to the term soy daesh as a cultural legal category. The earlier usage of that is muhajir, which you might know, right? And this is the term that was used and still is used by migrants from the Balkans who came much earlier, but even before the founding of the Republic, escaping from um, the Balkan Wars. So they were coming in receding from the territory that the Ottoman Empire was losing, um, and they were coming uh, back to what then turned into Turkey. So the migration from the Balkans has a long, long history. And, um, and in the hierarchy of migrant desirability, the migrants who are Sunni Muslim plus from the Balkans sort of when the, I mean, they're, they're considered 
on the top. I think it's also partly and because mm -hmm. of uh, the empire's remaining claims on Europe. These are our last um, vestiges, uh, remainder, uh, reminders of our claims onto Europe. Plus, they were well educated. They were in the higher ranks of um, the founding establishment of the republic. So, so they have a very formative role in the history, and and that continues throughout waves of migration that I briefly alluded to, because after that initial founding stage of the Republic, when these people are by and far the most desirable of all um, possible migrants, during the Cold War, they also continue to be, because running away from communism and coming back to one's homeland is exactly the kind of political discourse that bolsters that kind of Cold War logic. So they're always accepted with much fanfare. They're given citizenship. That stops in the 90s. So 1989 is the last migration wave when all of them are granted citizenship. After that, they turn suddenly into undocumented migrants with certain privileges. In terms of the relations among them, it's really complicated. On the one hand, there is help and reciprocity. One has an uncle, one has a grandfather, and they help. And the law also um, asks for those kinds of reciprocity. The, uh, one of the amnesties that was granted that led to citizenship qualified that in order to apply for citizenship, you had to have a relative of the first degree who had become a Turkish citizen. And again, this is one instance where predict unpredictability worked in their favor because people were like, what does first degree mean? For a while, no one seemed to know, including those who had passed the regulation, at first, people were saying association representatives or officials you asked, they were saying it only means mother, father, and children. And then it got extended to include grandfather and sister and brother. So, so there was kind of a law in the making through this arbitrariness. So, so they have to rely on the help of these people for even access to legalization. They rely on their help for finding houses, for finding other kinds of resources all the time, but it's a fraught relationship. It's fraught because, for example, those who come in the 90s are already suspects. Why didn't you come earlier? When we return to our homeland to preserve our ethnic cultural roots, when Zhivkov, Todor Zhivkov, the Bulgarian communist leader, was assimilating us and changing our names and banning the speaking of Turkish. And so we came back to the homeland, even though not all of them came for cultural reasons. A lot came for economic reasons. But that gets then um, into this discourse of why didn't you come then? And now you're coming because the economy in Bulgaria is bad and you need the money. So this kind of labor versus real migrant distinction gets made even by those former migrants from Bulgaria as sort of an accusation against the ones who come later. And, and the post-90s migrants are very aware of that and, and resentful of it. And in fact, many of them have tried to come. They came, they went back. So there is no clear cut um, distinction when you look at migration patterns. Well, picking up on comments that both you and Heather made, but th so there's a lot of discussion about solidarity, and since this course has been on labor, we've been talking about solidarity from the beginning um, and from the, the speakers in the series. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've been talking about labor solidarity, and, and when we were talking about your paper in class even, sometimes the labor and the immigrant solidarity, right, because what, what exactly the solidarity was around mm -hmm. um, was combined in offered some pessimistic right ah. um, takes, but also some, some it, it evoked some potential connections. But I, so, I, so we also had a speaker who worked for the National Domestic Workers, well, founded the National Domestic Workers Alliance um, that some people attended, and I, um, and uh, which has been involved in, they've also been involved in international efforts, but about organizing domestic workers, and we had some terrific folks from here from San Antonio who were doing that organization 
mostly undocumented Mexican and Central American workers. So I wanted to just think about um, if, if you could talk about solidarity specifically in the labor context, so, and, and even just with domestic workers. So one, you know, you kind of gave us two different vignettes that went different ways, right? So in one instance, um, one of your interlocutors, she doesn't want to, the one who quits, right? I mean, at the end of the day, she would have had the power to stay, but not to have the conditions she wanted. Um, and, I, and, and so I'm just, so I'm trying to formulate this mm -hmm. to kind of get to, so, because I don't know enough. So one question would be, who else are domestic workers? Mm -hmm. um, and is there any way in which these kinds of networks, as the informal ones, help with people being able to strategize their labor conditions? Um, even if most of the domestic workers are um, from Bulgaria, presumably some of them might be not, might already have citizenship or only want the circular migration and figured out the three months situation, whatever. So they would be in different, different situations of not privilege, but really of what they're looking for, right, which might affect their ability to bargain in the workplace. So I just kind of wanted you to think through that around domestic workers, but also maybe more broadly in the labor market, because at some level, and not the garbage pickers, but I mean, at some level, the employees have some power, right? Um, especially the more their work is needed and it can't be mm -hmm. taken care of by um, the, the domestic market. So I'm just, and the thing that makes them less like, least likely to have power is that they could be detained, deported, um, et cetera. And that would be very much the US story, but I just wonder if you could expound upon that a bit. Okay, so actually the one sphere of the labor market in which migrants work that has been written most about is domestic work. So uh, several colleagues have written about domestic workers who come from the Philippines, so that's how it all started. The Filipino workers were the most expensive and desirable because they spoke English, so the upper class um, mothers who wanted to work but also have their children be raised by people who spoke English hired uh, Filipino workers and then it opened up to Moldavians who came next and then the Bulgaristan and then it really opened up to Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Georgia, Armenia, mig migrant women from Armenia and and there was a very um, palpable hierarchy in terms of how much you would be expected to make depending on what country you came from. So the hierarchy of desirability translated into immediate monetary difference in terms of what you could expect it to be paid. And since this was at the time when all of this was happening, the domestic labor migrant was also completely unregulated. There was no really way of um, controlling or negotiating, I mean, one sort of had to accept what it was. And if you were a migrant from Georgia, it was really hard to be paid as much as a migrant from Bulgaristan would be getting paid. And people seem to have been pretty much resigned to that. Um, there was, at the time that I was an activist with the Migrant Solidarity Network, we liaisoned with this group it wasn't even a group, it was basically two or three women who were citizens who established, who tried to establish a network that would try to gather all different migrant domestic workers together to form a platform of solidarity. Um, it wasn't very successful. I mean, from what I saw was spaces of solidarity form among people who are from the same country and who refer each other to their networks and it remains limited to that and it didn't broaden to a, a larger kind of cross country, cross ethnicity kind of organization. Now interestingly, when it became the case that almost every middle class household in Turkey, including, you know, not even upper middle class, 
middle class because this labor is pretty cheap. And, and so women increasingly join the workforce without men feeling like they have any obligation to stay home and take care of children. So it became very common that everyone would employ uh, a, a person who came from elsewhere. And here the reason is before locals were employed for such work, but they don't stay in, they're not staying nannies, they don't want to stay overnight. So the advantage of the um, international migrants is that they're going to be there around the clock. So, so the government decided to first regulate that um, realm, and in a very smart and insidious move, they put out an announcement saying all migrants, after they pay their fees for their overstay, will be given, will be exempted, and they'll have three months of stay, whether they didn't specify any sector, so everyone went with fear because it's also an act of documentation, right? They collect information on whoever is an overstay, and people really did pay enormous amounts of money um, with the hope that they would then be regularized, and they were only for three months. It turned out that this move had been undertaken because then they made it, whereas it wasn't possible before to get a work permit as a domestic, then they made it possible. They made it possible and they also made it punishable if the employer didn't get the work permit. So again, an instance in which the move to regularization was also a kind of constraint on these savvy kinds of movements. I mean, the, the person could leave if they didn't like the um, employer. Now if they leave, they lose their permit or they need to find another person who will get them a permit. But why I'm saying this is that it relates to your question about the broader market. This is, I think, another case of internal legal differentiation where such um, regularization was enacted only in one realm of labor, and it didn't apply to agricultural work, where Syrian migrants work. It didn't apply to seasonal picking fruit kind of work, where you know it didn't apply to construction work. So this was kind of the <laughs> sector that was chosen as one that was to be regulated. It makes it, I think, very hard because the structures for spaces of solidarity that would be fostered through trade unions, whatever, are practically non-existent still. They're indifferent or openly hostile to such um, organizing. And then it really falls on the undocumented themselves to organize. and. It, that hasn't really caught up yet. Maybe it will. So on this question of hope and pessimism, I mean, that's exactly kind of dichotomy I want to avoid. Um, so it's, this is my, hmm? Yes. Yes, so, so I know this is difficult and maybe I want to eat my cake and have it too, but I want to resist that too easy resort to a politics of hope that just by invoking hope as a self-evidently category that will unite people and spur them to action, I want to show as um, Anne Svetkovich and the Public Feelings Project has shown that you know positive feelings are also ways through which we govern ourselves and not necessarily emancipating ways mm -hmm. always. So I want to gesture to the complicities that hope also entails. That doesn't necessarily mean lapsing into a position of despair. I think it's, it's being cautious of these um, easy kinds of calls to hope without looking at mm -hmm. these distinctions between different kinds of hope, goal-oriented, open-ended, which become blurry when you look at. And Lassie, yes, but I, I mean, I want to say in response to Lassie, I think the Bulgari Stanla have their Lassies in their lives. I think what I'm trying to say is that there is a way in which those more immediate networks of empathy and solidarity are too easily elided in these activist calls to then get to a very abstract platform of collective organizing where that move, even though I was part of it, I just didn't see it happening. Instead, people feel safer with their lassie and intimate family to rather than making a leap towards um, something that feels especially dangerous in a context where you have no um, 
lawyers or trade unions or um, a system or even NGOs that will work for your cause. So it's almost that kind of incitement to hope is again almost putting too much of a burden on some migrants to politicize in the ways that we as activists exactly want them to politicize and that's kind of what I want to be more careful about.